which if it's EC2 based, you are managing a lot of that platform basically. Yes. But the first question is why? You know, are managed services a good candidate for my workloads? And it really, in typical consultancy, it's, it really depends basically on, uh, you have to analyze that yourself. How, how much value is added to your solution and how unique are your requirements that you need to manage the entire stack of that operating system, basically, and the platform itself. That's gonna help you answer that question, is, you know, initially, when customers come in many times, is they're used to doing things a certain way, and they may have two different answers. The first time they're asked that question, and then as they use the platform more, they have a different answer. It's because they understand the value that they're able to gain and things that are offloaded from them that which aren't necessarily adding a lot to the actual solution or to the end, end product itself. So when you're looking at <clears throat> deploying something on premises, you know, this might be oversimplification or some things may not be applicable to you, but you're, you're, you're basically talking about the same things. So you're talking about managing physical assets managing the deployment of operating systems and applications, the scalability and the backups, and the actual optimization of them, you're managing that entire stack. You may not, you may not be responsible for all these steps, but somebody is. So by just running on EC2, you're able to offload you know, the physical aspects, the maintenance of physical equipment, and the actual installation of the operating system itself. Because you're choosing a region you're choosing a subnet, you're choosing an instance class, and you're choosing an AMI or Amazon Machine Limits, which is the OS to deploy. Just by doing that, you're, you're, you're having immediate benefit right now. But you're still are responsible for the patching, the installation, the scaling, the availability, the backups, all that is still your responsibility. And that may be okay, but the different options we have from a managed service perspective, potentially remove everything in yellow from your responsibility. You still have the dials and configuration options to kind of meet your own specific requirements from availability or performance perspectives, but you don't have to manage the, the full stack itself. You can focus on managing basically the performance and the data and the access it and the security of it. You know, there's a bit of an eye chart here for a reason. You know, when you log into a region, specifically some of our larger regions like US East or US West too, this is the eye chart you're gonna see. And for the most part, everything you see on this, on this page is a managed service. EC2 is scratched out, and that's one of the sole ones that you don't really classify as that. You know, we're not gonna cover all these uh, in this session, obviously, but um, I wanted to kind of show you that, you know, EC2 is a lot of times is the first stop. You should, as you learn more and get more comfortable how you do things, you should look at potentially other ways of doing things. I want to cover a few of those right now. The first is managed or our directory service. Think of this as, as our uh, managed Active Directory. You know, Active Directory is a core component to the majority of infrastructures. You know, do you want to reinvent the wheel? depending on what transition you're in, as far as migrating to somewhere like AWS, do you want to completely reinvent the wheel and deploy a full Active Directory stack within your infrastructure? Or do you want to just in integrate with it? Or do you not need to integrate with it and you want to deploy something that's AD-like as managed service, or do you want to use a full AD stack within AWS itself? These three options provide use cases, uh, meet the use cases of those scenarios at all, uh, uh, for, for each of them. So the first is with um, our Active Directory connector, our AD connector. This is a very simple, think of it like a proxy, back to your Active Directory. You're, de you're deploying you know, highly available proxies in multiple subnets within your VPC, will serve as the proxy point or conduit back to your existing Active Directory infrastructure. The, the only gotcha here is you need to have private connectivity from your VPC. So that translates into leveraging the virtual gateway, the VGW, 
using a hardware-based IPsec VPN or a private interface for your uh, virtual interface on your Direct Connect back to your on-premise. You need to have that in place to use this. But going back to this statement I said, do you need or are you able to decouple yourself from that on-premise or that existing Active Directory? If not, this is a great enabler of interfacing with it. As you, as your requirements as far as interfacing with that Active Directory potentially lessen, maybe you have a development environment or maybe you have other siloed environments which one, you don't need or want to have directly connected to your on-premise, but you still need the benefits of using some centralized directory like Active Directory. That's where a simple ID comes in. We're able to, again, you're able to deploy this in a highly available fashion across two availability zones within your VPC, but it gives you AD-like capability. It's Samba-based, so those who are familiar with Samba, you understand what this is providing. You're able to manage users, you're able to manage groups, you're able to join it from a domain perspective, but you're not gonna have a lot of the advanced features that Active Directory gives you. You can't establish trusts, you're not gonna have schema, schema extensions, things like that. So you need to measure what your requirements are for your actual directory needs and see if this maps up, matches up with, with those. If you do need those, those, those uh, advanced capabilities, that's when you start thinking about using something like our Microsoft AD managed service. This is an actual Active Directory deployed on uh, Server 2012 R2. It is a managed service though, so you don't have OS access. You don't have domain admin access. But you can establish trusts. You can do schema extensions. You can do conditional forwarding for your DNS requests, things like that. So you're starting to get a lot more capability that's reaching the parity level of doing a self-managed Active Directory, but you're reaching the benefits of using a managed deployment where you're not dealing with the patches, the availability, things like that. Storage. You know, this is S3. You know, those of you who worked with AWS for quite some time, you're like, why are we talking about S3? You know, but, but S3 is, it's synonymous with AWS, to be honest with you, to some degree. It's one of the first, if not the first public service available, made available from AWS in 2006. But this is where it all starts for most customers, is storage. You know, this might be their first on-road into using AWS. They might be doing backups using traditional tape libraries or things like that, or they just need to offload a bunch of storage of objects that they have on site, they just want to put it somewhere. This is where S3 really benefits that, those customers, but it doesn't stop there because this, is, this integrates with all of the services which you're able to leverage to do, you know, make, you know, that might be good enough for you from a storage perspective, you just want to store the data, but most people want to do something with that data. So that integrating it with S3 is the perfect hub for doing that, basically. But you get all the benefits of using the S3, which we'll cover right now. You know, standard objects within S3 have 11 nines of durability. So when you write that object to it and it comes back with the 200 uh, status request saying, yep, I'm done, it's already been replicated across multiple locations within a region. It does not leave that region unless you tell it to. But 11 nines of durability is, is almost difficult to fathom how, uh, um, what that availability you're getting, or durability you're getting to it. Availability is a little bit different. You know, the durability data is number one. I guarantee that's number one for what you, obviously you need to access it, but this is rated at 11, I mean nine, I mean four nines of uh, availability basically. But the, the beauty of it is it's infinitely scalable. You're not allocating storage to S3. You're, you're putting objects to it and it's scaling for you and it's, it's, a, it's the beauty of the service itself, is there's nothing to manage from a storage perspective outside of some of the options I'll cover right now. But some of the um, features that have been added to S3 over, over, over time, you know, it's adding to the flexibility of it and the accessibility of it. So things like event, event notifications. You know, prior to that, when you needed to know when an object was put into your bucket, you had to do some custom uh, code or some type of monitoring of 
your buckets themselves to know, okay, did something get added here? Okay, I need to keep checking, checking, checking. So now, by simple notification enablement, you can, be, you can trigger either an email or a message, or actually what's better is trigger work to happen. So think of like transcoding or file processing needs to happen. You can have this all set up automatically, basically, within there. <clears throat> Cross-region replication. You know, there are 11 nines of durability for the objects themselves, but some customers either want to bring the data closer to another set of users, or they just want to have an extra assurance uh, that they are taking all the precautions that they can. So by a simple few clicks within the console, you can replicate all your data that's been, from that point on, added to that bucket, replicate it seamlessly over to another um, uh, region, S3 bucket, basically. So it's nothing to manage there at all. S3 endpoint, uh, VPC endpoints win S3. So the S3 is a public service. It does not run within your VPC. Some services do. S3 is not one of them. So you need to get to it. VPC is a private network. So you need to be able to run resources in your public subnets to route through your internet gateway to get there. Or you need to use something like a NAT instance or some type of proxy to get there. But once you do that, you're introducing a lot of choke points, potentially, depending on how much data you need to go to and from. And it's hard to say these instances can talk to my S3 bucket, but these can't. That's where the endpoints come in. It allows you to have private, privately hosted instances talk to a public service directly. S3 is the first one right now. And you're able to get extremely granular saying only these methods are allowed from this subnet or this host. And you're able to enforce a high degree of granularity and auditability as far as what systems can talk to my S3 buckets. It's a fantastic way. Can I, can I can get through this real quick? Yeah. And it's also integrated with things like CloudWatch, so you know how many objects and the storage of those objects as well. And you're able to increase the bucket limits. It used to be a 100 hard limit. You couldn't get around it. But now it's a soft limit. You can increase the bucket number uh, uh, throughout your account. And read, write, route consistency was more of a legacy issue dealing with US standard buckets. I'll cover the SIA here in a moment, um, but lifecycle policies I'll cover as well. But those are the way of enforcing your, your, your business logic and your housekeeping of your storage of your objects themselves. And transfer acceleration, if you do anything transferring of data to and from uh, AWS I mean, to S3, and you use, especially if you use any type of WAN optimization product, this is going to be a product a feature that you should look at, especially if the distance between your source and the S3 bucket is um, a greater distance, it's a highly optimized way of transferring data to and from your S3 bucket. So going back to the storage classes, you know, there's three ones that we'll cover now. We have standard, we have standard and frequent access, then Glacier. And the way you can think about those, oops, is the hotness of the data itself. So the, the hotter the data means the more access, the more it's going to be accessed, and the more you need it available to when you do need to access it. That's what standard is. Glacier is, I want the durability. I just want it there. Someday I may need it, may I may not. But that's very cold. Think of it like a tape. Well, the one in the middle is the standard and frequent access. Basically what that's doing is you're getting the same benefits of S3 standard from a durability standpoint, um, but you're not paying for it to sit there hot. Um, but there's a little bit of constraints to it as well. It's, it's Think of it like a warm data where you know you don't need it right now, but when you do need it, you need it available immediately, just like an S3 standard. That's what S3X, uh, infrequent access, enables. It has the same durability, it has the same transfer accessibility that S3 standard provides, but you don't, uh, you're not paying for the storage of those objects in that storage class. What you are paying for is the retrieval of them. So you need to be careful as far as how is my, you need to know your, your data uh, heat maps, basically. And you can map them directly using lifecycle policies to rotate them through those heat map, those, those stages of storage to meet your actual retrieval requirements. So it's a very, very powerful way of only paying for what you need, but having it accessible as it's needed as well. So standard frequent access, so we went over that a little bit right already, is, you know, the gotcha there is, the couple gotchas are with it. It has a minimum storage of 30 days. So if you create an object in that storage class and you delete it immediately or within 10 days, you're still paying 30 days of storage for that object. 
It also needs to be 128K kilobytes in size at a minimum as well. If it's less than that, you're still paying for that. And then you're obviously paying for the retrieval or one cent a gig to retrieve that data. So if you can, if you understand what your constraints are and it meets your requirements, it's a great way of reducing your cost because it's half, less than half the cost of standard S3 storage at uh, one and a quarter cent in the US standard versus three cent uh, US uh, standard storage. So you can think of here, you know, the top is the standard SIA and everything. So you can see how you know, it just meets your storage requirements as far as meeting your tiers. And then on the right, you're going to use lifecycle policies, which are rotating the data from those tiers for you based on different parameters that you set that meet your business requirements. You're not doing this manually at all. It's a very secure way of doing that, but also from a housekeeping way. The one last step there that's not on there, it could be deletion. You know, after X number of years, delete it. I don't, I, but you don't want to keep accruing all this object storage over time. So it's just a very, very uh, easy way, but very powerful, but more importantly, it's a very secure way of uh, managing the life cycle of your data. You know, whenever the costs are ready. DNS. Yeah. Not everyone thinks of DNS. They don't think of it, the only time they think of it when it's not working, basically, is, you know, the, it doesn't matter how available, how much architecture you put into your system, you know, spreading over multiple availability zones, going over multi-regions. If your DNS is down, your application effectively is inaccessible, and to a user, it's, it's down. So DNS is, a, is, is extremely uh, important service of the architecture, which is, to be honest with you, it's, it's, it, it's quiet until it's known, basically. So what is Route 53? That's our authoritative DNS service, basically. It translates, think of it like a phone book. It translates IP addresses to the host names instead of phone numbers to names. In a nutshell, that's what it does. Um, you know, 53 is just a play on the port, uh, TCP port that uh, DNS traditionally uh, runs on, basically. So root 53. So how it works, you know, you're running here, you're run, doing a lookup on something, you have to go to, you go to your DNS resolver that's local. It doesn't know where that host is, but it can look up who's the authoritative source for that domain. In this case, it'll be root 53, so it'll find that domain, return the record back to you, and then come down. That's how it works. But the beauty of something like root 53, it's not running in one location. It's not running on one server somewhere. We have 56 edge locations throughout the world. It's running all of, all of those right now. So when you go to do a request, you are resolved to the closest location and then you are retrieved the record from there. So if that something happens for whatever reason to the edge, that one particular location they get routed to, you'll get routed to another one automatically for you. So you're, you've built in availability of your DNS. So it's highly redundant and extremely high uh, availability of that service itself. You know, it's propagated, uses AnyCast, which just helps you determine where to get the, the actual DNS records from. And it's extremely cost effective. Um, you, it's, the request rates, what you pay for them, it's going to be a, a rounding error on a dollar for the most part, if you, even if you're getting into the millions and millions of uh, requests. And it has a lot of advanced features, which we'll cover. Some of those being, you know, has the capability of actually being a registrar as now. So if you need a domain for many of your common top-level domains or country-specific domains, you can register it straight from Route 53 now. Geolocation, as I mentioned before, it's, it, it's, you're able to do things like, you know, um, you know, localization of traffic or routing people to the right destination based on where, they, where they're coming from, a geolocation perspective. That's not latency, though. That's, you know, a database of IPs and knowing where those, those IPs are actually registered to, what country and what part of the country. You're able to leverage that, basically. But there's, there's things, there's ways to get around that, though. So. One other one is private DNS within your, within your VPCs. You, know, you may need to use you know, more common DNS records, host names or domains within your, within your private infrastructure. You, know, you can run your own Active Directory, you can run your own bind or things like that, but you can also leverage Route 53 for that same capability as well so within your own uh, D VPCs. Health checks. This is where, not only from a distribution running all the edge locations, this is where you start seeing an incredible differentiation from your traditional uh, DNS provider. 
you're able to incorporate health checks into the actual, your records themselves. So you know traffic is only going to be sent down to, from a resolution standpoint, to a healthy application, basically. And if it passes some sort of threshold, either from a latency perspective or you can run a health check um, somewhat advanced, you can check, you do a retrieval through your app to get a record from your database. Right there, you're testing every tier of your application stack, getting, make sure everything's talking to one another. If that fails, something's wrong. I don't want to send data down to that, uh, to, that, to that application layer. That's where DNS failover comes over as well, is you're able to have, you know, one single resource record can have multiple targets. And the only, there's a path it'll follow as far as the t where, it, when it goes to the next target. One good example is, kind of the example I just gave now with, you have a traditional app beyond an ELB app, a web app, and DB. Health check fails, you know, not retrieving the record I'm expecting. Something's wrong. Instead of the user getting a, um, an error page, why not pr figure out a way to give them more of a, I refer to as a fail well page or some other content to let them know, hey, we recognize there's something going on right now, but they're not getting some type of 400 error or some other error that they have to interpret where they, your, their experience goes down. This is where you can leverage things like S3. You can put a version of your site. You can constantly scrape your site and put into S3, or you can just have a version of your site within S3, and you can cut over to that site immediately if, uh, if Route 53 determines there is a failure of a threshold failure of the health check. So the, the user will not get that error when, they're, when the, something is being experienced. They'll get a, a very controlled message from you that's hosted within S3. The beauty is also is when that host comes back online, or an application comes back online, Route 53 is going to know about it, and they're going to swing it back back to the application for you natively. So that is a pretty powerful way of uh, doing your DNS, basically. Now let's move on to Elastic Beanstalk. This is, you can think of it as an application management platform. You know, when, when you look at, when you're deploying an application to a server, you can think of it as a series of layers uh, that you are managing, basically. You know, you have the physical host itself or the VM. You have to put an operating system on it. You have to put some type of container or application or interpreter on it, and then you have some, something to serve it, um, you know, Apache or IIS or Tomcat or something like that. And then, then you actually get to the point where you have your code and your application itself. This is what Beanstalk really helps you um, manage everything. So all of that, those lower layers, you're able to kind of offload that into a service, basically, where you can actually just manage your actual application code and the deployment thereof. You know, looking at a typical stack within, within Beanstalk, you have a couple different options. You have, I just need a single server. That's all I want, uh, but I want to make sure that's always running all the time. Or you can run in more of a load balance, auto-scaling uh, fashion, where you are decoupling your, whether you have one or more uh, application servers by an elastic load balancer. And you can also incorporate things like RDS into your stack as well. So this is a very, very powerful way of running your common framework applications that you're building, but you're not managing all the infrastructure. Yes, you still have dials that you can have from a parameter standpoint as far as, you know, what does, uh, how many of these do I need running? Um, you know, what, are, what do I, what constitutes a scaling event to me? You know, is it CPU utilization or some other health check that says I need to scale this out more? Things like, there's a lot of other benefits to it too, but Beanstalk is one of those services that is a fantastic onboard for new customers onto AWS to manage their platform because it lets you see the value of, of what something like AWS can provide, but you're not, you don't have the burden of managing all the infrastructure underneath it. But the beauty of it as well, it's, it's really just a, um, think of it like a curtain. You can peel back that curtain when you're ready or when you need to, and you can go straight to EC2 and manage your resources there. You can go to RDS and manage your resources there. But otherwise, you can use that at an abstracted level and kind of leverage what Beanstalk is providing you, and you just manage your own application itself. So it's very, um, it's, uh, you have a lot of options in the platforms as far as what you can leverage within you. I mean, it's not just for .NET. It's not just for uh, Java. I mean, you can use Node.js, PHP, Docker containers as well. 
Python, Go, and Ruby at this time. So if your application frameworks kind of fall within these into this platform, because it is a platform. You know, you, some people use Heroku and things like that. So you have to kind of fall in with some type of requirements for it as far as the level of customization and configurability you need for it. Because you don't, the other beauty I should point out is even though this is a platform service, you still have full root access and administrative access to the host that you're actually deploying within this too, if you need it. But not always should you go down that path because you need to realize what you're changing sometimes and just leverage, leverage the platform as much as you can. But here you're just choosing, you have your code, you choose where you want to run it. What container type do I have? What kind of deployment model do I want to follow? A single instance or kind of a load scaling, auto scaling approach? And does my database, if it runs on RDS, do I want this part of my stack or do I want it just external? Uh, th that's really it. Um, you have other configuration options you can do, but that's really what it comes down to. You can use the management console, you can use some of your existing IDE tools like Eclipse or um, Visual Studio, or it comes with a command line um, interface as well. One other feature that came out relatively recently was the ability to kind of, you know, all these frameworks have, you know, this platform, there's always updates to them. You know, it's Java, there's other, uh, depending on the framework, there's always updates to them. You are responsible for those though. I mean, it's an OS. It's a static object that once you deploy, you are responsible for maintaining those, basically. That Beanstalk does not preclude you from that. But what one option that just came out is the ability to kind of leverage Beanstalk and schedule those platform updates for you. So when a platform update becomes available or you set on a schedule a weekly at Saturday night or something like that, it's able to main, deploy those for you, basically. And I'll show you how. You know, looking at existing infrastructure here from a Beanstalk, this is a little bit oversimplified, but it's the same idea. You have requests that come into a load balancer, which then feed into an app tier or some type of tier. Here, it's represented by Auto Scaling Group, which has four active instances right now. When a new platform update becomes available, there's a degree of immutability to this, basically. You're not changing the existing deployment. It's staying as it was, and you're still serving the traffic as it was as before, so it's very consistent. Instead, a new uh, tier or a new set of infrastructure is deployed using that new image which has the platform update already built into it. It deploys the same thing in parallel to it. You can think of the blue-green. I don't know if people have think, heard of that model before, where you're, 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 you're keeping your existing infrastructure as is, but you're deploying any changes to a new, new deployment basically. So when the new system comes online and passes the health check, it then, it'll scale out to meet the current um, scaling requirements that are in place on the, on the blue. And then once that passes, you know, when you create a Beanstalk deployment, you know, you, you receive an endpoint basically. And all that does is point to, for the most time, points to an ELB. So in this case, that, that de, um, a Beanstalk C name or d domain record is pointing to that top load balancer. Once it's passed all the health checks, that, that DNS record for the Beanstalk will be updated and point down to the bottom one. So the existing one uh, stays in place and you can determine when to tear it down. Users don't go to anywhere different. There's no configuration changes to make. Obviously you have to deal with things like TTLs and your DNS, but you can handle that. There's ways to deal with that, and there's cutover windows you can do to make sure you're dealing with that. But the beauty is, these, is the, the level of risk that patches and platform updates following this model has been dramatically reduced. Because if there's any issue at all with that green deployment right now, you go right back to the blue, and you haven't changed anything. So that's, that's a way of making patches a non-event, basically, whereas now, that's a very complicated and risky uh, process of doing inline patches to your production environments. This is a way of addressing that. And then you could tear down the old one. This becomes your live environment and you can follow that same step over and over again. You can follow this exact same step where any application deployments as well. Again, it's a very safe and um, risk averse way of doing actual deployments, whether OS based or application based. RDS. This is our relational data, I'm sorry, relational database service that we have. You know, 
we support many of the common uh, database engines that are available uh, out there that people use, whether a commercial model using Oracle and SQL Server, or more in the open source realm with MySQL, Postgres, and MariaDB. We also have our own uh, homegrown option, which is MySQL-like. It's called Aurora. And I'll go over some of the details of that in a little bit, but that's a very high performance and very uh, scalable and available uh, database platform. But just like everything else, doing database patches, uh, doing backups, doing um, replication is, can be difficult. It can be very expensive as well, depending on the engine that you're working with. This is a way of offloading a lot of those types of uh, tasks to us, basically, and then leaving you to deal with the security and the performance that you require in the schema for your uh, application. You know, you, you can meet your security requirements from an authorization and access control, you know, authentication methods. Um, encryption, you can do data at rest encryption, either natively within the, the, the actual instance itself or whatever the, the uh, uh, engine supports, like from Oracle, you can use TDE. I believe you can do it from SQL Server as well. So depending on what you need from a Christian standpoint, um, you can meet that as well. And you can also do it in transit as far as connections using SSL. And just like with EC2, um, use security groups to whitelist the actual ports and protocols you want to allow traffic to and from. And this is a bit of a matrix of the, the engines that we support and some of the different things that differentiate one of the cells from one another. But one thing you want to clue in on is like maximum storage, you know, EC2 based ones. You know, you might have a very, very large database that may not meet this storage requirement. The first thing you want to ask yourself is why? Why do I have this much storage in my database? It may be completely justified, but Anytime you start getting these gigantic uh, RDA, RDS databases, RDMS databases, you kind of want to understand what is, what is the workload that I'm actually fulfilling with this, with this database, this one single one? Is it, my, is it my, serving as my warehouse? Is it serving as my transactional? What, what is the role this server uh, is, is playing? That's, that's something you really want to see if you can decouple those and re just see if you can readdress uh, some of those uh, aspects of it. With Aurora, you can go up to something like 64 terabytes of storage. And it basically is decoupling that storage layer, which is that green layer there, which is spreading it over three availability zones within your VPC. So it's doing a high degree of replication for you. And you're able to get extremely large uh, files, I mean, uh, databases because of it as well. And it's designed for a lot of availability, and you can do a lot of read replicas against it as well. So if you're running a MySQL, a very large MySQL database, Aurora is one you can probably should think about, or at least test it out, see how it fits within your architecture. You know, deployment is very simple. It's just asking a few different questions. You know, the engine type, the instance class. You know, do I want multi-AZ or not? The storage type, and um, how much of the storage. That's basically it, and then it'll deploy it for you within a number of minutes. Yeah, we just covered that. And the multi-AZ, that's, that's, that's not an easy uh, task to do, uh, and a very expensive one as well. Uh, being able to have a synchronous replication to your database and not have to worry about the management of that um, is, uh, it's a, it's a, it's, that's almost like a um, key differentiator of our RDS service, basically. And just like with Beanstalk, you have a global, a global endpoint for that database as well. So if that database cuts over to that standby and it's promoted, and that's the live one in the second availability zone, that same DNS record is used for the application. You don't need to change anything. It's handling it for you. And then replication is, is sent back to the, the previously pr primary one for you automatically. So you're able to go to and from and there's nothing to manage for you. You can get alerts when that happens. You know, depending on the database platform as well, you can use things like read replicas, where you're able to bring, uh, either bring the, offload the transactional components of your, your um, primary database, so that you're able to kind of offload all the read queries to a separate uh, instance, or you can bring it closer to an end user as well. It's a great strategy to use for that. 
And you can also use things like cross-region snapshots to either bring it closer to your developer community that might be working there or just bring in uh, from a DR perspective, you want to have one, one level of assurance and bring in, copying that data to another region, you can do that. But it does vary by, there are some restrictions, especially if you're dealing with encryption and whatnot, you need to be aware of when, uh, when you've gone that path. But um, for the most part, it's, this is a great way of kind of enabling uh, the, the copying of data uh, to another region. Which leads us to Redshift, going back to the earlier point of why are you using, the, what are you doing with this database right now? Is it you know, a very large Oracle database, which you're doing a lot of your transactional and your warehousing within one? You might want to look at something like Redshift, which is our managed data warehouse platform. You know, this is extremely capable uh, solution. Um, you're able to do a massively parallel, kind of petabyte scale uh, of uh, data, database, uh, or data warehouse, basically, but it's fully managed for you. And there's a couple of different paths you can go down from a storage perspective. Do you just need a quantity of storage, or do you need highly performant storage? And that, those, basically the two paths you need to, the fork in the road, as far as how much storage do I need? And depending on the actual procurement model from a res RI, res uh, reserved instance, um, it can drive down the cost tremendously, uh, going down to um, $1,000 per ter terabyte per year. But that's not the on-demand uh, charge for it, though. Uh, in a nutshell, this is kind of the layout of what an, a data warehouse uh, looks like from a Redshift perspective. Uh, you have the concept of a leader node, and then you have what referred to as one or more compute nodes. The leader node is your interface from your application, basically. This is what you're talking to. The compute nodes, this is where the actual data, data warehouse is. So when you're talking to the leader node, it receives the query, it knows where the data is, and it does, it sends the job down to the compute node to run the query it needs and retrieve the data, and then the leader node gives it back to the, to the, to the client. And you can use S3 or Dynamo or EMR as sources to um, ingest into Redshift itself. But you're able to grow, depending on the storage model that you choose, uh, you're able to grow to a very large database size. You know, dense compute, where you really need high performance and SSD-based storage. You know, you can see you can grow to about a, you know, a little over 300 terabytes of the storage, but it's highly, highly performant. And then dense storage is going to be more magnetic-based, local storage to uh, the actual compute engine itself. Think of it like ephemeral disks on EC2. That's going to you know, be able to get up to, uh, depending on how many nodes you use, get up to two petabytes of storage. And it can get extremely fast as well, but you might need to change how you do things. It's columnar based. So it's a bit of a shift depending on how you're doing your warehousing right now. But if you can adapt to using something like Redshift, you'll be able to get the performance you need, but without how having the license burden uh, coming along with it. So it's, it's all about I.O. You want to reduce the I.O. as much as you can using columnar store, uh, there's compression, using zone maps, which is kind of like, think of it like an index of your data on the disk so it knows where to get it from, and use large block sizes as well. So again, the cost of an I.O. goes down further and further with a combination of all these uh, components, basically. It's also, it's a managed service, so you're con con continuously doing uh, uh, backups to S3, and you can also do cross-region uh, snapshots as well, where you can copy this to another region automatically. And it's also highly available as well, so when you, on the com compute nodes themselves, there's, there's storage. Um, the data is replicated amongst those disks, as, and then, but it's also, as you add more nodes, compute nodes to your cluster, the data is replicated across the compute nodes as well, so you can handle disk failure and a node failure as well. And using cross-region replication, cross-region snapshots, um, you can handle some type of region issue, connectivity issue as well, so you have those snapshots available to uh, rehydrate your cluster. And security is built in, like with much of the services, using SSL, using encryption at rest. Um, it's also been um, 
reviewed the security controls uh, for the service itself. It's been measured and uh, reviewed by a 3PAO, uh, aligning with various compliance frameworks, you know, dealing with FedRAMP or BAA or PCI, to name a few. So it's a very, uh, very controlled, very consistent, very secure service. Now moving on to certificates. You know, using SSL or TLS to kind of protect the uh, transport of data in, uh, in motion is a very, very uh, important security uh, control for applications. But managing those certificates and you know, procuring them becomes a bit of a process and it can get expensive and the costs of making a mistake on one of those, especially not renewing them, can be pretty, uh, can have a big impact basically. So recently we released our certificate manager service, which allows you to provision SSL or TLS uh, based certificates for use within AWS with, right now it's only usable with our ELB or at a CloudFront distribution level. You know, they're useless for you outside of, uh, they're not, you can't use them outside of those services or outside of AWS but that'll change over time. But for now, it's ELBs and uh, CloudFront just distributions. Right, we're getting a little bit of a interference here. I'm at the switch. Okay. You know, we handle all the generation of the key pairs and the CSR generation, and uh, we manage the renewal uh, and deployment of them as well. Um, and it's available through common uh, points with the management console and CLI. So you can use them with single domains, or you can get wildcard domains as well, or a combination of the two. So this is a very quick way of securing your, your connections, basically, within that, that type of infrastructure with the ELBs or CloudFront distributions, basically. And they're, they're using a very strong uh, encryption al algorithms for the generation of them as well. And that's, in a nutshell, I wanted to cover is just exposing you to some of the options that are out there from an AWS perspective as far as, you know, once you start learning, you know, using AC, there's nothing wrong with using EC2, but there might be, it's just like anything else, there's an evolution to this whole concept, especially with AWS. Things change. It's constantly changing. So using AC2, there's nothing wrong with doing that, but there might be better ways to do things by leveraging some type of managed service from AWS, which is the majority of our, our capability. You can do a lift and shift from your existing infrastructure, bring it to AWS just like you did everything. And there's definitely some benefits to that, you know, capacity and other things you gain. But the real value you're gonna achieve is that the further you can get up in that stack, that's where the real value is gonna be from how you do things within AWS and how much it costs. So once you understand your workloads and how it maps to the requirements of the services that we offer, that's where you're really gonna start understanding you know, can I, will this, will this work for me? And most of the time, it will, but that's up for you to decide and try it forth. But I appreciate your time today. Thank you.